Before we begin this discussion, uh, I want to bring something up on the screen. It's important, actually. So many of you have traveled so far. I'm determined that you make the most of your time here at the forum. You'll see a QR code pop up. It's super important. It unlocks a world of possibilities on your smartphone. You've been through this drill before, so you know what I'm talking about. It allows you to submit questions to moderators like me, and it allows you to participate in live polling. Is the QR code, there it is. So please do me a favor, pull your smartphone out of your pocket, scan the QR code, because we're about to begin the first of our live polls here at the 2023 New Economy Forum. I would like you to vote right now on the following. The biggest winner from global supply chain restructuring will be A, Africa, B, the Indian subcontinent, C, Latin America, or finally D, Southeast Asia. Again, you can participate in that poll by scanning this QR code, and we here on this panel, Globalization 2.0, will be talking about the results. Merritt, Noel, Jim, great to have you here. Thank you. If you asked most people who have anything to do with economics, multinational business, global trade, they'd tell you that it's obvious, right, that the global economy isn't reverting to the free movement of goods, free movement of labor, free movement of capital, the hyper-globalization that reached its peak not long before the COVID-19 pandemic. But some people call that deglobalization, some people call it re-globalization, but I think it's worth pointing out that we heard something completely different from Vice President Hahn just moments ago. In fact, he talked about globalization being inevitable and irresistible. He talked about the necessity of an open world economy. He talked about supporting multilateralism and promoting the free flow of, I think he called them production factors. Many of you here heard his words live. Is the world that he wants to go back to, the world that he envisions for the future, still possible, Merit? Well, thank you. Good morning. It's nice to, to be here and uh, have this conversation with you and colleagues. Um, well, I welcome those words by China. I think those, uh, and it would be uh, uh, very helpful to see continued uh, opening of the Chinese economy. So if that's part of the message, I certainly welcome that. I don't see the world as deglobalizing. I see uh, uh, changing uh, shifts, uh, you know, uh, part of my life is as an academic, I work with a lot of academic institutions. I think there's a lot of research that has shown that, you know, manufacturing may have peaked, uh, but, uh, you know, we've out of the period of hyper-globalization, but continuing. You're seeing shifts in patterns of manufactured trade. You're seeing continued growth in services. But what you're also seeing, I think, are pressures uh, within uh, economies uh, uh, and the introduction of new policies that are obviously raising concerns about fragmentation. That's one of the themes of this conference. But at this point, it's not clear how far this is going to go. Uh, uh, but I think there's an overcharacterization of deglobalization. The days, however, of creating you know, multilateral trade rounds uh, for large-scale global liberalization are not with us. I think what we are seeing are more regional arrangements. And of course, this region has been uh, a place of great dynamism around that, whether it's RCEPT or, or on digital DEPA or CPTPP uh, and so forth. So I think there are these regional trends. And there are other trends uh, around areas that have no history of, of rules, which are more coalitions of the willing for uh, sort of non-binding, but nevertheless foundational principles. So I see a multi-layered world where there's some restructuring of supply chains uh, for both economic and policy reasons. There's experimentation, but it's not a world of stark deglobalization, but pressures for fragmentation. 
Noel, Jim, I want to hear from both of you on this subject as well. Can we go back to the kind of globalization that we knew, at the very least, until the late 2010s, and which, as Vice President Han pointed out, had been enormously beneficial to China? I've got three comments. I, to try and describe the world in a binary fashion normally gets you into trouble. So to stay where we were, no change, or everything goes back to the way it was before then, you know, deglobalization. The world is too complex to describe in a binary state. I think there are four key factors at play at the moment. Clearly, there are two very obvious ones, geopolitics being the obvious one. Resilience post-COVID, everyone learned the stretch that we're in supply chains during COVID, and I think resilience is a factor. Um, I think innovation's a factor. Uh, innovation around technology generally or innovation around energy supply has taken place. They're going to change supply chains. Innovation is changing business models for an awful lot of industries. And the final factor, when you talk about China, China itself is changing its economic growth model. Yeah. The economic growth model of the past three to four decades is changing with their intent. Uh, they're going more towards... Uh, driving domestic consumption as a growth uh, factor for the economy as opposed to manufacturing and export. You put those four factors together, the world is going to change. Um, I don't think it's going to change uniformly for all industries and I don't think it's going to change uniformly for all business models. But we've got to accept the fact it's changing. But I don't buy into the binary extremes of deglobalization or full globalization as it was. I'm more in the re-globalization, but there is a binding constraint. This is my third point, economics. The world is struggling today with high inflation and high interest rates causing low growth, both economic pressures and social pressures. You go to a full world of de-globalization where supply chains have to be repapered fundamentally from just in time to absolutely at home. The economics that we're experiencing today, I think, are going to be magnified hugely. So the binding constraints on how those four factors play out, I think, will be economics. I don't think the world can afford even higher inflation of repapering every supply chain. I don't think the world can afford the social unrest that would come from that and higher interest rates and low economic growth. That change process would take decades, and it would be challenging. Jim. Automakers like Volvo are as highly exposed to supply chain dynamics as any companies in the world. So I'm curious, in addition to answering this question, perhaps you can provide us with some context um, and explain, from your point of view, uh, how dramatically conditions in global trade have changed over the past several years and where you think they're headed. Yeah, and I think it's way beyond the last several years. To be, even when we went through this massive phase of hyper-globalization, there was changes, there was nuances, and people had to pivot and understand. Remember, if you go back 15 years, there was a China plus one strategy. That was 15 years ago, people were starting to talk about that. Now it's starting to be implemented with a little bit more gusto. But the nuances of hyper-globalization was always there as people moved more and more. And this building the east and sell to the west, of course, became the prominent business model. But it's changed in the last five years. When you put a tax tariff of 25% on a car that is manufactured in China to be sold to the USA, you automatically change the business model at that point. And people who are paying attention back in 2015 and 16 realized that. But there's been hundreds of small instances along the same continuum, the pandemic, uh, uh, was one of those. But I agree completely with you know, all. This is not binary at all. This is going to be very, very nuanced, in my opinion, and it drives four things. The variation that we see in supply chains now, the value that is created, the volatility that you see in certain instances as well. You put, And, of course, the single biggest thing is the visibility, especially for car manufacturers. We're making investment decisions four, five, six years into the future. And no one has a crystal ball. So you've got to factor all of those into the equation when you're making those big multi-billion dollar decisions. Um, and that does lead us to now 
build where you sell and source where you build much more in the past. Again, it's, it's not binary, but the continuum has moved to much more in region for region. Build where you sell and source where you build. And we started that five years ago when we first started to see those large tax tariffs become prevalent in the marketplace. Merritt, I want to come back to you. Um, clearly, some of the transformation that we're witnessing in trade and investment is being driven by market forces. We've heard about some of them, um, the kinds of things that Jim deals with on a regular basis, and Noel's clients deal with cost, security, supply chain diversification. But I want to know a little bit more from you about the policy side, and then, of course, from, from Jim and Noel as well. Jim just talked about tariffs. That's one sort of you know, policy weight, if you will, on global trade. But now we have this new wave of interventionist industrial policy, like the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, where's that taking us? Well, you know, the Inflation Reduction Act is, um, as well as the CHIPS Act and the Infrastructure Act, you know, they, they have a variety of objectives in mind. Uh, some include basic R&D. Some are uh, coming out of a resilience uh, motivation because of a, a, a desire to continue to be a, a force in semiconductor uh, production in the United States and part of a decarbonization agenda. So there are a variety of agendas, I think, uh, implicated in really historic pieces of legislation. But they also speak to, obviously, very large subsidies. Um, and those coexist in an environment in the United States where there are also uh, more investment screening and restrictions, some export restrictions. So when we talk about industrial policies in the United States or around the world, I think we have to be looking at a, a range of instruments of interventions, not just subsidies, but subsidies are the largest. Some countries, and particularly developed economies, seem to be doing this uh, quite a few. Europe has developed its own semiconductor strategy. China has its version. So uh, there are a number of countries, especially developed, but also China, that are using these tools or have for a long time. Um, and there are many others who won't be able to use uh, those instruments. And so, uh, you know, they're finding and figuring out other approaches which is what I think you're seeing in Southeast Asia and other parts of the world. Noel, does it feel to you like, like the, the, the outcome of these policies that we're just talking about now are on the whole positive, or is there a significant risk of you know, beggar thy neighbor protectionism, for example, um, and, and other knock-on effects like the ones you had alluded to earlier, for example, inflation? Uh, there's always a risk of protectionism. I, I think we'd be naive if we didn't think domestic politics comes into play in international trade. Um, but I, I also wouldn't... I mean, a, the IRA Act was a, a very positive fiscal measure to stimulate a certain set of outcomes, particularly around sustainability. But there are other means used by other geographies to create similar economic outcomes. I mean, we just heard from His Excellency in the Middle East. There's economic diversification taking place in the Middle East. Uh, the fiscal policy being used there is the sovereign wealth funds. They're changing the shape of the Middle East um, economy. As a consequence, China and the Middle East, Asia and the Middle East, India and, you know, India and the Middle East, they're getting closer because they're using their sovereign wealth funds where the US is using the Inflation Reduction Act. All countries will use whatever they have available to them to, for their economic interests. So um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't make it purely a political play. It's an economic reality. Economies have to change. I want to go back as well on supply chain. I remember visiting a client um, in Bangladesh about eight, nine, ten years ago. And they had already, Bangladesh had already become the largest garment producer, larger than China, back then, for a major retailer in the West. You know, changing supply chains is not a new phenomenon. It's happening all the time. Um, but it does get influenced by government policy. You get influenced by economic um, necessity. The Middle East want to diversify their economy. They will get closer. There's huge opportunities taking place now. 
I think just in the last um, year, 18 months, $50 billion worth of deals have been signed between China and the Middle East. And that's, there's about a pipeline of around $2 trillion, uh, still to be worked on. That will change supply chains. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Jim, Volvo's an automaker with an all-EV strategy. What's it like to navigate the subsidy maze? Yeah, and that's a transition. <clears throat> so you don't go from being a 100-year-old company or almost a 100-year-old company that was predominantly built on internal combustion engine and then automatically switched to EV overnight. So you need to go through that transition phase, which means for a period of time, you're actually running two supply chains. That becomes complex. <laughs> um, but you've got to go through that journey. But you've got to believe to say, we are going to be a fully electric company by a certain point in time so that you can take both your own company and your supply base through that, that journey. And you can do that in a measured and progressive way. But even then, it's going to be nuanced. Because different parts of the world are moving towards full electrification at different speeds, partly driven by infrastructure, partly driven by legislation. And so that's another nuance. Now, I'm, I'm neither an optimist nor a pessimist. I'm a realist and a pragmatist. And I think at the end of the day, pragmatism will win the day. And what I mean by that is that our job as leaders in business is not to really try and predict the future. Of course, that's part of it. Our job is to position our companies to be able to react quickly and decisively and sure-footedly when those changes happen. So when we see different ecosystems develop around the world, let's say in the auto industry, if you look in, in, in China, you see it as a different ecosystem. You, you know, YouTube versus Billy Billy, WeChat versus uh, WhatsApp, um, Google Maps versus Navi Maps. You need to be able to make sure that you can understand both of those, but still have a global product. And that's really where the, where the, the nuance comes in. So I don't think it's, it's our job really to say, we know exactly what the future is going to be. I think our job is to say, we're going to position our companies with enough flexibility and enough resilience that we can, and we've done that. I mean, just look at the last five years with the pandemic. Lithium prices spiked by almost 10 times. We had a problem with semiconductors. All of those things get poured in on a daily basis, so it comes back to supply chain resilience. I'm an optimist. I, I saw duplicate supply chains as a great financing opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I'll stick with you on this one. Um, companies, <laughs> of course, are looking for alternatives to building or sourcing in China. And the term of art used to describe this trend is de-risking. Um, HSBC is the single biggest trade finance bank in the world with a huge footprint in Asia. So among your clients, how powerful is this exodus from China? I mean, I think the, the supply, the, China is also changing. I, I go back to the comment, China is changing its economic growth model. So its supply chains and its supply to the world is going to change over the next 10 to 15 years. It is already changing. If I look at just the statistics I'm seeing at the moment, in our banking of Chinese clients, there is more activity on those Chinese clients going out of China at this point in time than there is activity into China. So Chinese suppliers to the world are also changing their supply base and they're diverse in their supply base into other parts of Asia, other parts of the world. Um, so I think their excess capacity or their intellectual property is not just confined to the landmass of China, it's actually also going beyond China, and we're certainly seeing that. I spoke to our CEO just recently uh, in the last week in China, and, you know, he's seen 70% growth in activity in helping Chinese clients diversify their business model outside of the landmass of China. Um, so that's, a, that's an interesting shift. I also see it going the other way, in that the multinationals of the world, um, Volvo being a classic example, are doing much more China for China. Um, and you know, still investing in what is gonna be an interesting growth curve in the consumption market in China. I mean, if you look at the GDP per capita in the cities 20 years ago, 
um, how many of those had breached $12,000, which it, you know, the economists of the world would say is a tipping point? Not many. You roll forward 20, 30 years, how many cities will have GDP per capita above $12,000? A huge amount. The urbanization is changing the consumption market. Therefore, if you're a supplier of products, would you want to be part of that? Economically? Yes. Politically? That's not my game. I, I look at the economics. <laughs> Merritt, you talked to a wide range of CEOs. What are you hearing from them about their strategies vis-a-vis -vis China? Yeah, I do talk about China with many different industries, and I think the responses are different by industries. So I'm pleased we have an automotive leader here because I do think there is a lot of innovation happening in China uh, in EV batteries, et cetera. So sometimes the discussion gets a bit skewed into thinking that innovation is only happening outside. There's a lot of innovation happening in yeah. that sector in China. So I would think for your industry, it's really essential uh, to be there for lots of different, different reasons. Um, uh, so a China for China strategy, I think, is something one hears a lot of. Uh, I say, for other industries like uh, MasterCard, it's a pretty incredibly innovative environment and also one of growth of consumption where it's important also to, to be there. So it depends by, uh, by industry very much and there are uh, some areas where economics are pushing China out of China, Chinese firms obviously, and into this region. So I think you're calling this connectors uh, 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 it's, a, it's not a term I've yet um, fully adopted, but I think it's the right concept is that you're, you're seeing uh, Chinese investment in the region, other forms of investment, both for the global markets and back for China. So there is a, and those are some of the dimensions of the restructuring that I'm seeing that are mostly market driven, but also influenced by policy and concerns obviously about uh, technology. Jim, Volvo's owned by a Chinese company, Healy. Is it, does that make it easier or harder for you to crack the China question? So, so we're, we're publicly listed on the stock exchange in Stockholm. So we're a public company that, that is governed by the rules and regulations of the stock exchange in Stockholm, but we have high ownership from, from the Geely Group. And there's massive benefits for us in that. We can share that technology, we can share those investments across a bigger group and get more leverage. So that's the, the, the huge benefits. But, but to Merit's point, there is a huge amount of innovation that happens inside China on key technologies. There's a huge amount of innovation that happens outside China, in Europe, in the USA, and even other parts of the world. Our job, I think, is to try and harness all of that great innovation and pull that together into a single product that can get that into the hands of the customers and thereby differentiate ourselves uh, against our competition. That's the strategy. And that, I think, can work well. I don't really think it's about China and non-China. If you just look at some of the things that's happening around the world, the Green Deal in Europe, for example, the CHIPS Act, the, the, the Inflation Reduction Act, subsidies in all its various forms within, for EV around the world, driving towards a more sustainable economy, direct to customers, uh, consumer, and the e-commerce engine that has been driven by that. All of these things are, are they're nuanced, but it's not China, it's not bifurcation or China and non-China. This is just a more complex world that we live in today. I think it's tremendously exciting. I think there's a huge amount of opportunities. I think we're gonna come out the back end of this. We're renewed vigor, we're renewed, renewed resilience, having came through the pandemic, learned a hell of a lot from that especially on the e-commerce side. And I think those economies that really, and those companies that really lean in and figure out how you can bring the best of the world back together in a slightly different format will be the ones that really succeed. We began this panel by asking the audience to participate in a poll. I think we should reveal those poll results. Uh, panelists, you can see them on the back wall here. We asked, who will be the biggest winner from glo global <laughs> supply chain restructuring? Will it be Africa, the Indian subcontinent, Latin America, or Southeast Asia, as you can see, Southeast Asia, by far the winner. Uh, to conclude, let's get into a little more granular detail there. Uh, forgive me, Merritt. Um, who, specifically, can we talk about countries? Which countries, in your mind, are best positioned to come out as winners from the supply chain reorientation? 
Well, I think, um, you know, geography still matters. So I think that Mexico is going to be a beneficiary when it comes to North America. I do think this region, what's interesting is that Singapore, but the region is making efforts, uh, I think, to integrate further. Um, so uh, obviously the numbers are saying Vietnam is, is a significant. So, uh, you know, you can point to a number, but I wouldn't land on just one. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I think Mexico will be, a, not only will be, is benefiting as we speak. We're seeing a lot more activity taking place on nearshoring into the US. And then across the rest of Asia, I, I don't think there's any one country. The, the key ingredient is, it's not just can you manufacture, it's do you have the logistics to match the manufacturing. And that's what China's built over decades, manufacturing and logistics. Uh, and therefore... You've got to have manufacturing capacity, logistics capacity. I don't think there's any one country alone that can be the destination for anything that is in China, in Asia. I think multiple geographies will benefit. Vietnam is certainly, but there are Malaysia is. I think it will depend. You know, certain garments are great in Bangladesh, other garments are far better in Sri Lanka. It's going to come down to many countries should be a recipient, not just one. Jim, some of the decisions that you make help to determine who wins and who loses? Well, I think when you have academia, when you have government and when you have industry that can work truly together, you start to see great things happen. We've seen it here in Singapore. I've lived in Singapore for a number of years. And that triumphant of, of, of academia, industry uh, and government working together is a huge, uh, a huge benefit. But I'll throw a few other things in there. One is talent, of course, access to talent and free access to talent, allowing inward uh, talent to come in to, to fill in the gaps that you may have within your, or within your country. The second, of course, is the technology that that talent helps to develop. And we're seeing that play out right now in semiconductors. Everybody's rushing towards the sub-5 nanometer semiconductor game. And that's going to help us with generative AI and the next wave of, of uh, um, let's say, technology that's coming from that. The third thing, and we see this already if we look at the Inflation Reduction Act, is energy and energy security. We haven't spoke about that today, but if you're bringing in huge amounts of industry to your country and you really want to have green energy, then that plays a part. Mm. In actual fact, I think you'll see in North America that Canada will play a big part in battery production. Battery production is intensely energy um, required and therefore having access to hydro, green, cheap energy is going to be another recipient. And that brings nuclear back on the table at some point in time. Eric, if I may add, you know, we, this conversation it also hasn't spoken enough about the digital economy, and uh, I would say that deserves a lot of, of, of consideration because it's really uh, not just services, it's services plus manufacturing. It's this mm. big transformations that are happening. We also haven't mentioned Japan, which is actually in a really interesting state, I think, nor have we mentioned India. So just wouldn't want to leave the conversation without putting those on the table here. Well, on that note, allow me, ladies and gentlemen, to thank our panelists and join me in congratulating them. Thank you.